20 minutes, no more than that. So. Okay. Well, good. You can start whenever you feel like. Uh, mine has already started recording and I'm just going to mute myself. Sounds good. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Julia Guidi, and today I'm going to talk about our work, Bella, Berkeley Efficient Long Read to Long Read Aligner and Overlapper. And the context of this work is the novel genome assembly. Basically, the idea is that we want to know the complete DNA makeup of an organism in order to study genetics and epigenetics variations. The problem that we have with this is that sequencing technologies have like chemistry, like physics limita limitations. So if we start from a biological sample of a DNA, for example, the wheat genome uh, in this slide, we cannot just read the whole sequence and get that. What the sequencing technology does is to return a lot of short DNA sequences that the length is between 100 base pair and like 10,000 base pair, and sometimes also beyond, uh, depending on the sequencing technologies. But the idea is that you can get, you cannot get more than that. And the other things is that these sequencing technologies usually introduce some errors. And so you want to redundantly sample the genome to make sure that each location in the, in the genome has been sequenced multiple times so that you can reconstruct their loca that location correctly. And the number of times that we sequence a genome is called depth or coverage. And then the idea is that we start, like the novel genome assembly is starting from these short reads and um, assemble them together in order to reconstruct unknown genomes. And there are a few obvious challenges uh, in this. And the first of, is of course that we do not have a reference so the idea is that like, it's like someone enters in the room and drops a puzzle on the floor and then throw away the box. So like you need to reconstruct this puzzle and you have no idea if it's gonna be a cat, a dog or a landscape. And then as I mentioned, like we have very short pieces, like very short reads or like small pieces of the puzzle and these pieces could contain errors. And the other things comes from the biology itself is that genomes have repetitive regions. And so like, it's like in this puzzle, you have half of the puzzle that is a blue sky. So when you have blue pieces, you have no idea where these pieces come from. Is it like bottom right, top left or, or somewhere else? So the idea is that we want to start from these pieces, like these short DNA sequences and assemble them to reconstruct the unknown DNA. And we do this using the, um, overlap layout consensus paradigm. And this is because we focus on the long read sequencing technologies whose length is on average 10,000 best pairs and like open beyond. And the error rate is between 0.5% up to 15% and it's improving, improving quickly. But the first step is overlap detection. That is the most computer intensive step. And it's also the one that we focus on Bella. And the idea is that we want to find pairwise matches between all the reads in the data set. And if we would do that naively, it would be like a quadratic um, comparison of all the reads against all the reads where each comparison is like quadratic in the length of the read. And so in order to avoid this, what like, you know, any software in the state of the art also does is to use a K-mer base in the data structures where a K-mer is a subset of fixed length K. So the idea is that we want to match only sequences that have at least a camera in common. And I will talk more about how we do this. Then when we have found these overlaps, the next step would be to put these overlaps in relations together in a layout step and then merge this information in the consensus. But um, as I briefly mentioned today, we're gonna focus on the overlap detection part. And the key idea of our work is that in the set of the art, we see that the assembly step and also just simply the overall detection has can have many different uh, data structures and algorithm that it makes very hard to implement like parallelism in an efficient way, but also from like an algorithm point of view to like um, to have modularity and generality in the computation. And this is because we have very regular data structure and irregular parallelism. So what we do in Bella is that we see the overall detection step and alignment problem through the lens of linear algebra. And this allows us to have a better organization of the computation and generality, as well as having better parallelism strategies. And this is because as I will show, the main, the core data structure is gonna be uh, sparse matrix. And so the computation is gonna be sparse matrix computation. And this allows us to take advantage of, you know, the state of the art in, in sparse matrix multiplication from the HPC community. And so the idea is that, again, we move from an ash table point of view to a sparse matrix. So in this case, if we have an ash table where 
people are keys and the values are the states where they lived, we can easily translate that to a sparse matrix where the no zeros um, indicates that the person John lived in New York or like Chloe lived in pre states and so on. And so once we have moved the computation, like the core data structure from a Nash table to a sparse matrix, what we can do is that we can see the whole computation as sparse matrix operations. So what I'm gonna talk about today in details is the camera counting part, but mostly like the way we decide, like the kind of cameras that we want to retain that is important in order to ensure the quality of the output. And then I will talk about how we perform overload detection using sparse matrices and the pairwise alignment step. The first question that we want to ask ourselves is like, how do we, like, how do we pick the camera length? Because the idea is that if we have two reads, like in this case, and we pick a camera that a camera length that is too short, um, due to the error rates and the repetitive repetitiveness of the genome, what we would have is that if the camera is too short, we would find matches all over the places in the reads in the data set, right? So, like for example, we will find this five mer on both reads one and two, that is an overlap that we do want to find, but also we will find the same camera read three and four that are completely unrelated. So this is gonna increase the computational burden on the computation later on, and we want to avoid this and also complicate the assembly step. But at the same time, if we pick a camera line that is too long for the kind of error rate that we have in the data set, the problem is that we risk not to find good overlap, even when there is actually one, like in this case for read one and read two. So in order to find the optimal camera length, we develop a Markov chain based model that basically um, like models the sequencing processes process on two reads. So the idea is that if we correctly sequence a nucleotide base on both sequences, we move from state zero to state one. And if this like neck, right next nucleotide is also correct on both sequences, we, we move from one to two until we reach the K state that is an absorbed state. The problem is that if we commit an error of one of the two reads or both the reads, we need to go back to zero because we want these K bases to be consecutive on both the reads. And what we obtain from this model is the plot that you can see on the on the left. Basically, the idea is that you put this probability of finding a correct camer in relation to the uh, length of the overlap that you want to find. And usually, like two thousand base pair is like what we we might want to target. And this is because finding overlaps that are too short um, is not very convenient because they might be coming from repetitive regions. And so like in this case, what we want to look for is a camera line that is like around 90% probability of being correct. And this is because if we look at some data points here, where on the right, we have some empirical data for, for a, a data set with 15% error rate is that if we pick 17 as our camera length, we can see that we can reach like good recall and precision and keeping the runtime like reasonably low. But if we decide that we want to try a bigger camera, the result is that the runtime decreases a little bit, but at the same time, we have a huge drop in recall. So we are actually missing very like, like a lot of good overlaps that might be useful for the assembly step later on. And similarly, if we decide to go for a smaller camera length, the result is that we do not really like gain much in terms of recall, but at the same time, the runtime is like increases significantly. And that's something that we do want to avoid. So let's say that we have decided that like 17, for example, for this data set is, is the right camera length, right? But the thing is that due to the error rate and the fact that we have repetitive regions, you know, we might still find false matches. So what we do is that based on the camera length, the error rate and the data set, uh, and sorry, and the depth of the data set, we want to select some frequency boundaries in order to retain only cameras that appears only once in the genome. Because I mentioned in the beginning that the genome is redundantly sampled. So a camera that is unique in the genome might appear like multiple times in the input data set. So the idea is that we want to retain only cameras that were unique in the genome. And this is because like, if you look at this example, if we have a camera that is correct, but he, it appears many times in the input data set, we will just find the matches all over the places. Like in this case, we have region one and region two. 
that like you know signifies two completely different regions in the genome. You can imagine one being at the beginning and one at the end. But if we use high frequency cameras, we might still find matches between these two. And we want to avoid this because it increases the computational burden of the alignment part and it does not often provide valuable information. So the idea is that instead we want to use cameras that appear only once in the genome. And this is because it will uniquely identify a specific region of the genome. Now the question is how, you know, what's the probability that a unique camera will occur m times in our input data set? And the way we compute this is using this formula on the slides that where basically we have, well, a binomial coefficient, and then this is the probability of correctly sequence a camera m times, and this is the probability of incorrectly sequence that camera d that is the depth minus the m times that, that is the value that we are looking for. And so what we obtain is that if you look, it's something like the plot on the left on the right. And in this case, it's for camer, like camer line equal to 19, error rate of 5% and a depth of 100, is that camers that appear like between 80 to 100 times in the input data set have a higher probability of being unique in the genome. So we want to throw away everything that appears fewer time or more than 100 times in this case. But of course, before being able to prune the camera space, we need to count them. So we have a camera counting step that I'm not going to describe here in the details, but the idea is that what we obtain from the camera counting step is a hash table where we have our camera instance that is the key, and the value is the number of times that that cameras appear in the data set and in which reads we can find that camera. And then what we do once, once we have this hash table is we prune the space based on the band frequency boundary we just computed. Like in this example, we, we could say that we do not want cameras that appear more, more than three times. And so we remove the last entry in this case. And once we have this, we are ready to move from the hash table space to the sparse matrix space. So as we can see, we can have this matrix where um, cameras are the rows and reads are the columns. And each non zeros indicates that that cameras appear in that read. And Specifically, what we store in this matrix is the position of the camera in the corresponding read. And we have both the sequence by camera matrix and the camera by sequence matrix. So we have both A and A transpose. And once we have this, we want to multiply them in order to find the common cameras between reads. And the way we do this is using a simmering um, abstraction. So we know that like when we compute normally like a matrix multiplication, we will have an add operator and a multiply operator. What we do is that we overload this binary operation with a custom simmering with custom operations. So what we obtain is that, for example, if we look at in this particular example to read two and read three, our multiply becomes an assign operator. So what we do is that we take the position of camera one in both read one and read two, and we store that in the output non zero, where C is the output matrix. And then when we perform the add operation, it's an add and concatenate. So we take camera two, the position of camera two on the two reads and append them to a vector or like, like an data structure where we store the positions, but also increase a counter common camera where we keep track of, track of how many cameras read one and read two have in common. And what we obtain is the candidate overlap matrix C that looks something like this. So in each, it's a sequence by sequence matrix where each non-zero is the number of common cameras, like in this example, this uh, reddish uh, circle and the position of those cameras in the, in the corresponding reads. In practice, we compute the whole matrix, but then in the next step that is pairwise alignment, we only run it on the lower triangular matrix. And this is because it's symmetric. So and since pairwise alignment is very expensive, we do not want to do that kind of work twice. So what we do once we have this is performing like pairwise alignment that you can see as an element wise operation applied to each node zeros. And the idea is that pairwise alignment will return an alignment score that you can see can be seen as a similarity score between the two sequences. And if this score is not good enough, according to some parameters that I will explain shortly, we are gonna remove that entry from the matrix so that what you obtain in the result matrix R is just high quality overlaps candidate that we can use in the next step of the assembly. And the way the pairwise alignment works is if we have two reads, for example, read one and read two for our previous example that have this seed in common, 
what we do is that we know that they have something in common in the middle. So we want to extend that seed to the left and to the right. So basically each read-read uh, pair becomes like two, actual, two independent alignments that we can run in parallel. So in this case, the, light, the left extension and the right extension. But we also use an X-drop termination strategies that the idea is that if we have two reads, like in this case, read three and read four, that we can see that they are not related. They have this camera in common, but they don't actually have anything else or like much else in common. So the idea is that we start the alignment also in this case, left to right. And if the running score drops X point below the best score that we've seen so far, then we stop the alignment because we are not interested in keep running something that, that is already pretty wrong or it's clear that it's not a good overlap. So what would happen in, in this case, for example, if you use X equal to three is that we start the alignment. And if we assume that we are gonna assign a minus one like penalty for each mismatch, what's gonna happen is that we will have minus one, then minus two, because again, there is mismatches and minus three. And once we get to this point, we say, okay, our best score was zero because we did not have any match at the beginning of the, of the extension. So what we do is that we drop the alignment at this point and we do not keep running it. The other things is that now we have an alignment score, but overlaps can be pretty different in, in length. So we do not want to use a fixed alignment threshold, say, I don't know, 50 or like 100. And this is because it really depends on the length of the overlap. So what we do is that instead we use an adaptive threshold based on an estimate of this overlap that we can get from the seed. So starting from the seed and the length of the reads, we can estimate the overlap length. And we can use that and our scoring metrics to extract an estimate of the score, the alignment score. And then once we have this estimate that we can see as a ratio between the scores to the overlap, what we want to do is that make sure that we bound the divergence from the mean in order to make sure that we do not miss true overlaps. And this is because of you know, all the errors that we have in the data set. So what we do is that we have, like we, um, we model the churn of bound on our data where basically like churn of bound bounds the divergence from the mean when you have a large sum of independent random variables. So, and in this case, we can see each base pair match, so each nucleotide match between two sequences as a Bernoulli random variable. That is either like we sequence that correctly or not on, on both the two reads. And so the idea is that we can demonstrate that, for example, using a divergence of 10%, the probability of missing a true overlaps is very, is very little. So what we do is that instead of using the plain ratio to score overlap as a threshold, we will use that um, like times, for example, 90% if our delta is, um, is 10%. And so in terms of results, what we get is this is the runtime. And so we have, uh, we can see that Bella performs um, actually pretty good because what you have to consider that minimal two, MiCAT and NAP are overlap only tool while Bella here also performs alignment where alignment is like, 70 to 90% of Bella's runtime. And like minimum for the E. coli dataset is, to, is very, very fast. But if you look also at MiCAT and MAP, like Bella is not um, too far away, especially from MiCAT. And if you look at the CLR, that is a dataset that has much higher error rate, uh, Bella is comparable with, with MAP. In terms of accuracy, um, we have like, again, I picked E. coli and C. elegans because there are two datasets with two very different error rates. CCS is very correct and CLR, uh, it is not. Like it's like, it has a, like an error rate of 15%. So in this plot, uh, top right is better. And we can see that Bella is doing very good for the E. coli CCS data set. And this is like a proof that our like probabilistic methodologies can properly, uh, you know, model the underlying data when the error rate is, is low. And if you look at the um, CLR data set, this is like, um, it, could be a matter of like what comes next in December because I personally believe that like Bella and Mika are the one that are doing better because we have both of us has like consistently high recall and precision. Uh, well, for example, MIMAP2 has very high recall, but the precision drops below 40%. So this might make the next step of the assembly harder. And in conclusion, I just want to summarize what I just um, 
talk about. So we presented Bella, that is the first software to recap the overlap detection problem as a sparse matrix multiplication problem. And we also introduced probabilistic models to pick the optimal camera length, frequency boundaries, and how to filter out um, spurious candidates from like post the alignment. And I just want to briefly mention that Bella also integrates Logan, that is a GPU based X drop aligner, and that ins it inspired the distributed memory tool, the Bella 2D, that also includes the next step of the assembly step, the layout phase. So thank you very much.